Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My my guest today is Christian Crumlish. Christian is the benevolent monarch, and yes, that is his real title, of design and product, the user experience and product management, strategy, and leadership consultancy he founded in 2019. Through design and product, Christian has worked with organizations like Nest Health, EduWorks, and ListenApp, and he's currently working for the state of California as the product lead for COVID19.ca.gov and Cannabis.ca.gov. Prior to ascending to the throne, Christian was the VP of product at Seven Cups, a startup in the mental health and well-being space that is scaling compassion globally. There, Christian built and ran the product team, helping the company to become profitable without VC funding. Now, I must admit, Christian has an impressive career history, which includes time invested at Cloudon, a company that was acquired by Dropbox in 2015 as a senior director of product, AOL, also as a senior director of product, and Yahoo as the curator of the internal design pattern library. There are also many more highlights, which I'm hoping to explore some of with Christian soon. Christian is also the author of a number of books, including Designing Social Interfaces, which he co-wrote with Erin Malone, and most recently of Product Management for UX People, which was published earlier this year by Rosenfeld Media. A generous contributor to the global UX and product communities, Christian is a fellow at Rosenfeld Media, an advisor to the PathCheck Foundation, and a community host for people exploring the intersection of product and UX. He has also been a long-term mentor for Code for America, a co-chair of Bay CHI, and sat for several years on the board of directors of the Information Architecture Institute. And now... He's sitting on a chair somewhere in the United States, waiting for me to finish up this introduction and welcome him to the conversation. Christian, welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And it's really great to have you here too, Christian. And as you know, as we were discussing off air, I like to do a bit of prep for these conversations. And something that I came across in my travels for yours in particular was a black and white picture of a younger you, perhaps around <laughs> 20 years of age, possibly shot at college, wearing what looks like a military jacket of some sort. Do you know the picture that I mean? I, I think I know the picture that you mean, yes. What is the story of that picture? Well, it's definitely not a military jacket, although it has, I think it has some sort of thrift store, Army, Navy uh, flight wings on it or something, which was probably an attempt at uh, like a drug reference, I would guess. <laughs> some kind of, I don't remember. Um, it was college. It, it's a picture from my, my last year, my senior year of college uh, at Princeton from what, my eating club there, which is this kind of weird, archaic thing that's half like a fraternity, except that people don't tend to live in it like a dorm, if you're familiar with American fraternities. Uh, literally a place you go for dining, but also a clubhouse, and it's the a social group that you join, that you can join at Princeton, and, and, and it's a, a tradition there of some sorts. And, and I was in a club called Terrace Club, which was the fringe countercultural r radical club. I mean, in Ivy League terms, it was the first to, to allow Jews to join in, in the middle of the 20th century. It was the first to integrate racially. It was the first to have dances for the, the gay alliance on campus and things like that. And this is in the late 80s, you know, at that point. So, uh, and, and I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't that radical myself, in, uh, especially not when I entered college. Uh, but my friends, I think, influenced me and the group I was with. And anyway, so uh, uh, a good friend of ours back then took portraits of the members of the club that year and black and white makes everybody look stylish and cool. It was actually a number of years later that he, he sent me the, the prints because he was a little disorganized and it quickly became my favorite memento from college years. You said that you weren't that radical at least when you entered college. 
But I also look back at how you described your years before college while you're at school, at high school, and you self-described as a, I think you said you're a huge nerd. And so tell me about this movement from, I mean, being a nerd or being a geek, I know they're different things and Bob Baxley will chastise me for (laughs) equating them with being the same thing. But these are often uh, labels that we either place on ourselves or other people place on us uh, that reflect us being a bit different than the norm. You know, there's people that see see and live in the world a slightly different way or have obsessions about certain things. You know, what was this journey from being a a nerd, self-described nerd, to being a radical, potential radical person by the time you finish college? Like, what was what was that journey? Well, I'd say that there's probably a common thread the whole way that still is true for me in, in, in many senses, which is that I don't tend to thrive or spend most of my time ensconced in the center of a group, uh, fully committed to one group of people, the way some people are happiest. I seem to be the kind of person who spends time near the edge of the group and the edge of many groups uh, and at the places where the groups are interchanging and and the definitions aren't so clear temperamentally that seems to be what's always drawn me um you know but that's also probably a nice way of saying i didn't have the best social skills as a kid i, I mean maybe at some point i would have wanted to be the center of everything but that was never the path open to me you know i had i always I always managed to have friends. I've always had things that I like to do, but it wasn't always the the coolest thing or the most popular thing. I didn't always have the knack some some kids seem to have. I was clumsy in some ways. I, lo- I love some sports, but I was not greatly athletic, and I didn't get a lot of positive reinforcement that made me enjoy athletics. So, like a nerd growing up in the seventies, I read books. I had glasses. I uh, was interested in uh, science fiction. I uh, you know, my, my father worked in printing and brought home early promotional materials for Star Wars about six months before it came out. And, and uh, you know, we, we were cool at school showing people this thing that was going to have, you know, a place called Tatooine in it and all this kind of stuff that we were hearing about at the time. And also another thing from my dad being in printing was that he brought home books of, uh, well, lots of dummies to draw on, you know, the samples, you know, essentially bound samples. And, and, uh, books on typography and, and printing and lithography and stuff like that, because he saw that uh, we were artistic kids and would be interested in that. So, you know, I, I was both nerdy in the sense of like kind of a little bit, you know, not, not the coolest kid and, and, and a little bit of a know-it-all, a smarty pants reader kind of kid in some ways. And also geeky a little bit in the sense that we didn't really use that term back then, meaning like a person who could become obsessed with a thing, with Greek myths, with baseball, with, you know, later on computers and, and things like that. Um, and I was exposed to computers in grade school. Uh, my school had a, a shared uh, digi- a deck digital equipment, um, PDP-1130, I think, uh, that we dialed into with an acoustic coupler mod- modem. So now I'm doing that thing where you brag about the earliest tech that you ever encountered <laughs> as a computer person. And I played math games and Star Trek games on it on a thermal printer, you know, with no screen, and learned basic programming, just very simple, like, you know, 10 go, 20 go to 10 kind of infinite loops and things like that. So yeah, there were, I think there always was that interest for me in like getting obsessed with things that fascinated me, even if that wasn't cool or didn't make me popular, stuff like that. And by the time I got to college, I think I had kind of developed a more socialized persona and I wasn't a big man on camp. I still wasn't you know, the matinee idol or the the jock or anything like that. But I, I had carved out a niche newspaper editor in high school, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and always, like I said, was able to find friends. And it's just that I think the, the friend groups that I found were themselves not, you know, the, the king and queen of the prom, you know, kind, kind of style of kid. And so we together then started inventing our own counter or subcultures, borrowing from all the all the precedents we, we saw out there already. Mm. And you've obviously leveraged this into a strength of yours. It's something that, you know, if you look at your career journey, which will definitely come to being on the, not necessarily the center of something, but being able to, you, you seem to be able to join the dots particularly well, and you seem quite comfortable moving in and out of different particular areas of influence. And I also noticed that when you're at college, you studied philosophy at Princeton, right? Now, this is a fairly serious college, right? You know, but you 
you studied philosophy. Mm. You know, this is going back to, is it the early 80s, early to mid 80s? Late 80s. Late, late, late 80s, 80s, right? Sorry to pre- prematurely yeah. age you there, Christian. Right. <laughs> but, but this interested me, you know, why not? You know, you spoke about the jocks in high school and, you know, not being, you know, with, in with like the what's considered to be the coolest kids. So why philosophy? Why not, for example, business school? Oh, yeah. Well, business school didn't sound appealing to me at all. And, and I would say some of this is, came from my, my, my family, the culture of my family, which was education oriented, but also somewhat idealistic about it. You know, like, like there was a real commitment to the liberal arts, to, to the humanities as, as a almost ideological, you know, belief that, about what's good in the world and probably some sense of class striving too. you know, like a third generation Irish Catholic immigrants in the U.S. trying to have all of the trappings of of the upper class, you know, go to the best schools, have get the training, speak French, you know, things like that. And uh, so I think I internalize some of some of that. So in college, I was both encouraged and, and I think internally still driven towards what do I really want to study? You know, what, what interests me most, not what, what will set me up best for my career. And I don't say this in any sense in terms of like an evaluative or, or a question, question of character or value or anything like that at all, because I think in some ways it, was a, it came from a place of privilege and so much advantage in the sense that if you've been admitted to Princeton and you don't go out of your way to screw up your life, like you probably can coast through the rest of your life in America, you know, like you're probably going to be fine. And uh, particularly if you're a, a white kid, you know, and, and have other things like that, that, that won't, won't be held against you as you enter life out of college. So I, I can't universalize from my experience, but I think on some level, I felt like I had the freedom to spend college continuing to, to really just explore what interests me intellectually. And I don't think everybody has that freedom. So I don't look down my nose at anybody getting a business degree or someone who loves business as an undergrad and just wants to understand it better. Our society is very capitalistic and understanding business is smart. I mean, I'm understanding business now. My book is about business in some ways, you know, for people like me who came up through creative fields and maybe didn't feel that business was their native language. um, And I'm trying to demystify it and things like that. But that's also, but I came into it late as well. You know, it it wasn't my path into the working world or anything like that, a a business focus. Philosophy to me was actually, if anything, a way to postpone specialization because it's such a giant umbrella uh, for almost anything that you really want to continue looking at. Mm. And you have looked at a number of things in your career. You know, you have had an interesting career. It's had a few twists and turns in it for sure. You mentioned your father, he was in publishing, I believe you mentioned. Well, he was in print. Print, print. right? You know? print, yeah. So you, you early on in your career after university were an editor. You've been a writer. You're still a writer, clearly. You had some time in publishing. You also had some time as a literary agent. And then you, you took a, a shift. You, know, you, you leveraged those skills, I'm, I'm assuming here, I'm projecting here, into web strategy, IA, and UX. And then you had another shift where you actually moved from that role at Yahoo as being the design pattern library curator into being a product director at AOL. And now you've moved into this product leadership. I wouldn't say phase because I don't know if these things are sequential other than being mm-hmm. sequential in time, but you've certainly had a, a, a curious career path. Just thinking about your time and you're still in it, in UX and now in product, do you consider yourself to be a UX person or a product person? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. I, I thought you might say that. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's a cheap one, but 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 I would say yes. So for for in so I, I had to answer that question a couple of ways. So first of all, title wise, you know, in terms of the the day to day work I do and the role I take on as it's constituted nowadays, I'm a product person, I'm a product guy, except that's gendered. But you know, I'm a product person. And I'm also a UX rooted product person. I'm a product person who has, you know, if I'm T-shaped, the bar of the of the T or the the whatever the vertical bar of the T is is on UX, and not I'm not an engineer, um, and I'm not an MBA, or a, you know, I, I don't come from a pure business background, or, or any other. I don't come from a pro- project management background, a data analysis background, a sales background, all the other ways you can become a product product person. I'm rooted in UX, so I continue to have a UX lens on my work. I also am somewhat in agreement with Peter Merholtz, who sort of argues that in a certain way, product and UX are synonyms, that they're both 
ways to talk about the shared overlapping concern with making a great experience for specific people that they want to keep using. That's not conventionally how we use it. We use UX as a synonym for design. And and so I, I don't want to be too cute about this because these words are shifting meaning as we say them out loud right now. But I will say, for instance, that I, I never was 100% comfortable calling myself a designer. And it's partly because I grew up in a, a world where graphic design was really what design meant to me. And I knew that I didn't have, I didn't, that's not my, my greatest strength. I have some art skills, but that's really not my, my core strength. And I came to understand that I was a designer in many ways. And I was, I literally was a UX designer and interaction designer, and also that I had a lot of design skills. And so I'm comfortable saying that I'm, I'm good at design and I'm a pretty, pretty decent designer, but some people that's their identity. And I remember going to the very first IXDA conference and part of it was a little bit almost like a rave, like where people were meeting their tribe for the first time. And they openly use that kind of terminology, which, again, I think is problematic terminology now because the way the word tribe has been used over time. But generally a sense of like, I found my people. I, I'm having so everybody I meet here is like me. You know, th- th- there was a strong sense at that moment where kind of the IA frame was a little bit stale and that interaction frame was more with it and, and was more open to design tradition and things like that. And I really loved that moment and I had a really great time at that conference, but I didn't go, aha, this is, if anything, the IAs were my, my group already. So I, I, I didn't shift central focus in that sense at that moment. So to me, in putting on and taking off these titles and shifting a little bit the proportion of what I'm emphasizing on to adapt to what people value now or care about has never felt like a tremendous changing of my identity. You know, my, I, I feel like what I've done almost going back to publishing and through the internet eating everything has been fairly consistent in a lot of ways. Uh, You know, I'm an orchestrator. I'm a big picture person who connects the dots and makes sure things really happen and make sense and everybody agrees on what we're doing. Uh, I did that as a, as a developmental editor at a book press. I, I, I did that as an information architect or content strategist before I was an information architect. And I do that in product now. I have different levers, the techniques are different, the medium has evolved, but in some ways I'm opportunistically saying, oh yeah, yeah, that, I do that, because it's just like what they call what I do now. And it's non-trivial because often I've had to brush up on, I had to, when, when a company bought a company that I was at and said, we don't have content strategists, we have information architects, that's what you are. I said, okay. But then I, then I joined the Information Architecture Institute and the mailing list to find out what my new job was all about. So I haven't always just assumed that I can sail through because I'm I'm so devilishly handsome and clever that I should just be able to do any job I set my mind to. There's a through line from all this stuff, but I've had to pick up a lot of specific craft skills along the way to actually show up in these jobs and do them. You're someone who has a musical bone in their body. You play the ukulele from memory. Mm-hmm. And so when when you're describing that, I was thinking the metaphor I was using here or the story I was telling myself is it's like you have the strength of being able to play music or play the ukulele. It's just that the songs that you've been playing or the the music that you've been playing have changed over time, but that core strength has remained the same. Yeah, I like that metaphor. I think that has a lot to it. And I think that there's a, I like that music also is another one of these kind of systems that allows people to get aligned and harmonize and do things in ensemble because i I believe that's where my joy in this work comes from. That, 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 that's part of that through line I mentioned is that success for me is convening or, or, or assembling or supporting a group of people as they put on the dance together or, or, or the play or whatever the thing is. Do you think that we define ourselves a little bit too tightly in UX in particular? In terms of... Uh, the way Say more which... about the question. Yeah, sure. So do you feel that as a as a field that we are too restrictive in the boundaries between us and them that we draw around what it is that we do? For example, we in UX, we are not product people. We are not product managers. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tricky question. I think that it's hard to overgeneralize and these things are in dynamic play with each other. And, and if you took snapshot at any given company or enterprise and, and, and you, you consult, so you probably have visibility into a lot of different people trying to do this work. There are diff- It's like looking at waves. There are different stages in the like figuring it out and everything. I, I would say that 
UX people sometimes have a chip on their shoulder, understandably, because there's been this struggle for recognition for the actual wedging the field into existence at all. You know, like that, that, that took, there's a tendency to remember that people didn't want you there. You had to make a case for it and that it's still not fully accepted everywhere that it matters. So, so there's also the evangel evangelical strain, you know, which has this positive side because you're so excited by the way this approach is so much better than not doing it. You know, talking to users is better than not talking to users and the, the wins are all manifest. And so you, the, the, we've all probably been there where we've said this, I, I love this and I want it to happen. And I'm going to actually like advocate for it. I'm going to fight for this to happen. But the problem is sometimes you then come into the room preaching and, 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 and sometimes you've internalized that you're better than other people because you have this sacred truth that you figured out, you know? And I think that, so I think some of that, opposition to other roles is self-limiting and some of it's probably natural identity formation stuff like identity unfortunately is often defined as being not something else or we're the people who you know we hold our forks this way not that way or something like that and so if you say i'm ux not product you are i think circumscribing your own range probably more than is good for you especially with things so adjacent and so heavily concerned in each other's business but I also don't agree with saying I'm UX, not business, or I'm UX, not sales, or I'm UX. Like, I think, I think we, and I say this a lot, but, you know, I, I think we need to sort of focus that, that empathy lens or that compassion lens that we so famously, you know, aim at our end user and sometimes like turn it like three cubicles down and, and, and look at that person who we feel, you know, doesn't get us or isn't creative or, 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 you know, is somehow, uh, blocking what we want and spend some time understanding really where they're coming from and figuring out how how we are really like them and have things uh, where are we aligned or how can we be and versus a sort of you know a, a, almost an unconscious like denigration and I, I see it and again it's sometimes it's just like people cheer themselves up sometimes they're saying oh the other team is screwing us like like that's a that I've seen that in many different businesses business company I mean, in publishing editorial and production you know get mad at each other upstream downstream stuff things like that that's human nature so i'm not trying to ask people to never have those feelings or, or but i try to cut it like guys guys i try to cut it short when, when it's getting a little out of hand it's like hey remember they're they're working on something too they have they, they've got their own stuff it's like they're not trying to hurt us they you know let's understand better where they're coming from and that's a hugely important thing to do. And it is, this is a, a criticism that I have heard echoed by others who I've spoken to about this p seeming lack of empathy we have for our colleagues and the other people that work with us in our organizations. We seem to have it in droves when it comes to our users, the people we're seeking to serve, but mm -hmm. not so much internally. And I had been wondering about this recently, you know, whether or not this was something that was actually symptomatic of a a defense mechanism. You know, you touched on earlier before that some UXs have a chip on their shoulder and that the field has had to fight what it perceives to be quite hard for quite a concerted number of years to get some form of respect in the enterprise. And I had been wondering, you know, is this really stemming from a lack of empathy? Because everyone that I know in UX and design, and everyone I'm generalizing, but 90% of people have no problem with empathizing with other people. But I wonder whether or not it has something to do with their own psychology when it when it comes to how their colleagues perceive them and what they believe to be their role within the organization. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I also think that as people, if you seek influence or if you try to you know get the seat at the table that people talk about like that, the fantasy is that you're just going to break down resistance and the world is going to change and just become much more receptive to what you have to offer. And it's almost like, you know, a transformation, yeah. you know, now everything's UX and UX is the king and, and I have arrived. Know, it's, it's all, it's all rainbows and unicorns from now on. And I think that probably what's harder to accept is that the closer you get to the seat at the table, the more you inherently become like the other people at the table, you know, like you, you know more about what they deal with than you, you to be part of that conversation you have to drink from the chalice. You have to eat some of the food at the table. You can't be both. You can't be the pure artist, you know, and the money grubbing business person. If you if you work inside a business, 
you can be insulated from the business concerns and really just focused on your craft. And that's a totally great thing to, to be if that's what you want to be. But then if you say, oh, I'm not included in the decisions. And then when the, the conversations about decisions come up and you say money is evil, we should only do what's good for the end user and never consider, you know, I'm, I'm stereotyped, I'm, I'm using ridiculous examples, but, but you know, that I think that there's an inherent, again, that identity suffers a little bit if you say, you know, I might have to compromise if only by becoming more understanding of the things that I, I formed my identity around being against. You know, if you have to deal with that and reconcile those conflicts, you have to let go of some of that idea that you are superior, you know, that, 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 that you're just underappreciated. And that's the reason why everybody doesn't, you know, doesn't use your tool to solve every problem. Is it a question of maturity? I think so. I mean, some of it's professional, I mean, uh, discipline maturity. You know, I, I try to remind myself all the time and everybody who will listen to me that this is the infancy of the internet and we're going to be in it for the rest of my natural life. I mean, um, they'll write about this in the history books. You know, this is just when it all started. Of course, we don't know what we're doing. You know, we're laying down primitive axi axioms that will be built on and eventually deconstructed and, and, you know, like torn apart in the future. Can't believe they used to do it that way. That's so ridiculous, you know? And so the idea that there's a job called interaction designer and there's another job called prototyper and then there's one called product manager and these are immutable, like natural laws is, is ridiculous, right? I mean, these are just contingent ways to do this work that we figured out in this like roiling situation that I, in my, you know, 20, 25, 30, whatever it's been years of practicing, have literally seen about five or six or seven different models succeed each other. And they all were useful in some way at, at that stage. And they all were informed, a lot of them were informed by what went before. And I, I've loved being, I mean, how often do you get to be at the beginning of anything? You know, it's, it's super interesting, but I don't fool myself that I get to see the end of this or even the mature stage of it. I, you know, it's, it's just too big. Somewhat sounds like you're cautioning us against dogma. Yeah. I mean, let's not get locked into anything specific, like, especially because like even how the whole, I mean, one of my original sense of this was sort of like designer versus engineer, you know, the original UX people really were engineers. So they were kind of like, they were like heretical engineers often. And then <laughs> designers said, Oh, we, we have techniques for that stuff. And they got into the user centered HCI world or whatever. And then, you know, and they were pretty successful. I mean, there's a lot of UX and design has had a lot of wins. I don't think it's all moping around, but design versus engineering was a big thing when I first came up, you know, like, oh, they don't get it. And uh, I have no, it's been probably 10 years since I met an engineer who didn't care about UX or think it's super important. So that's a very obsolete stereotype, but it used to exist. But even then that, that like, I, I just didn't, I was like, this is silly. We're making software together. We're literally sitting together, figuring out what it should be. And you, I'm pushing the pixels and you're typing the code, but we do the same job. Like people from a distance can't tell us apart, you know? So this sense that like every, it's like, oh, we wear our hats like that. And we, they wear the hats like, it, it's like, it's ridiculous sometimes to me. I, I get that, that like, it, we do come from different professions and it's multidisciplinary and the cultural styles are different and the human nature. I mean, there's, I've worked with annoying people. I, I'm, none of it's, it's all real. I and mean, when people feel bad or don't like the work situation, it's real stuff. But I think to attribute it to like this kind of person and that kind of person, it, that, that's a bad road for humans to go down ever. So you've recently published a book, as I mentioned in your introduction, called Product Management for UX People. And I have to admit that when I read that title, mentally I substituted UX people for dummies. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then maybe that's just, that's just more about me than it does about you. Yeah. Being a UX person, I'm happy to wear that. Yeah. But are UXs clueless when it comes to product management? No, no, not at all. No, I think part of my point is that UX people are really good at some of the most important aspects of product management. Product management it has a lot to do with what they would call customer obsession and we would call understanding the end user really well or something like that, you know, but it's the same idea, which is like that you don't make software in a vacuum and then try to find people who might like to buy it from you. You understand problems people are having today with things they do all the time. And you think, oh, here's an opportunity to, to I bet I could get a win by solving that problem. And you do that by understanding that, you know, so I think that the UX toolkit and the both both the lens the way of looking at things and then the sort of collection of techniques and practices and the whole, the whole disciplinary stuff that's been evolved is heavily valuable in product management a, a product manager who's conversant in those things just like one who's 
technically savvy can can do a really good job working with UX people. And and in some cases, like where I've been in a small startup doing both jobs at once, you know, I don't highly recommend that approach, but it is actually possible, you know, in limited ways and compromised ways. And there's a Venn diagram that you've probably seen that I could critique, but for shorthand, it, it has designer UX as one of the circles and it has business as another one and then it has technology as another one and and then in the the sweet spot in the center it says that's product management or you are here is sometimes the way it's drawn to show product management again it's 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 a shorthand it's flawed in, in many ways and as i said peter Morholt says that's ux in the center there and it's design in one of the circles and and I like to mention that almost every discipline can draw a diagram <laughs> that puts it at the center and everybody else's job is being kind of a peripheral contributor but just for the sake of, of uh, a shorthand, that these are kind of pillars that go into product, certainly the technical feasibility and the desirability that, that you find, you know, on, on the UX side and the sort of viability as, a, as an enter, as, just as an effort. You know, it, it, nobody likes to be dependent on money, but guess what? If, you, if the thing can't pay its way, it's going to live in your basement forever. So, you know, it's, it's got to get up and get out there and, 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 and earn uh, somehow. And, and uh, so I think that, you know, clearly UX people bring that UX part to the table, but they often are less well-versed or less comfortable with those other two very broad categories. And I'd say good UX practitioners today are actually pretty good with the technology too. You know, again, not, not that they should be shipping production-ready code, but they can generally negotiate with an engineer because they'd like it some way and the engineer tells them that's difficult. And, you know, if you're savvy, if you work in tech, that's really kind of requirement that you you can you can discuss this stuff if nothing else. So that's that comes in handy too. But I'd say product managers often have more accountability around what gets delivered and what the engineers are spending their time on and building. Whereas designers tend to do this more like one-on-one -on -one negotiation around specific design or, you know concerns and may not have as much experience with that kind of scrum mastery, like watching, looking at what the whole team is doing and kind of keeping it on track when you don't manage them and you need them to buy in and be you know excited about what they're doing i mean that, that that's an art as well that typically a, a product person coming from a ux background would need to learn to cultivate and get better at practice and, and learn how to do that and spend more time on that and then often i'd say that business that giant category of business which is kind of silly because if you're going to make these circles it's a bigger circle than the other ones because it contains more things because business is a very generic term and and you know you have the going to the market and you have actually operationally running the business and you have questions like fi finance and, and, and other things, you know, pe hiring people ops, all this sales, just all these different businessy things. Any of them could be a concern. Any of them could be in the background of a product manager. Any of them might be a, a constraint or, or, or motivational factor for a product manager or something they need to take into account. And as I sort of hinted at before, people who've chosen self-consciously chosen creative careers or careers that leverage their their art skills or their their communication skills or their writing skills um, may stereotypically have avoided getting into business. You know, studying it, taking it seriously. They might mock it as like not very intellectual or not very soulful practice. You know, of of just. Being, being a bean counter, you know, or, or something reductive like I'm that. I'm pleased you mentioned that, Christian, actually, because you have referred to product managers in the past as bean counters in suits, you know, your exact words. Mm -hmm. And it certainly seems to me, at least from the product managers and product leaders that I know, that they are more analytically minded on the whole than your average UXer or designer. There's definitely more MBAs people that I can think of that have MBAs, for example, that have found their way into product mm -hmm. management than have liberal arts degrees. Is that a fair sure. stereotype? Well, I'd say that there's there's definitely truth to it in the sense that it's a more analytic. I agree, first of all, that product management is a, is a more analytically oriented discipline than UX design. That I'd say, comfortably, say, comfortably saying that. Also, that there's a lot of MBAs practicing product management, for sure. In fact, I'd say that there was a vogue for taking your MBA into product management directly in the last maybe decade at some point that, that was kind of on the ascendant. But I would also say that that is a, an older product management frame that still exists alongside newer ones, including kind of the Silicon Valley technical product manager who came up through, essentially came out of an engineering team, maybe as a scrum master or an engineering lead, and then suddenly 
was given broader responsibilities over the whole product. So that's a another kind of product manager that exists and, and a model that kind of came out of, of Silicon Valley. And, and then there's the, you know, the sort of the, the lean or ad, you know, lean product startup product management style, which is sort of a mishmash of things. I kind of think of the designer UX rooted product manager as the most recently born, you know, version of those of those things. And they all coexist alongside each other. What's interesting is as the as the product management uh, community of practice has matured, and, and I often like to say it's roughly 10 years behind UX, you know, like in, in email, lists, blogs, meetups, et cetera, it, it's following a similar path, but it's, it, it's, it's catching up. And yet some of the people who really helped get that going, like the mind, the product folks with their product tanks and stuff like that, they had UX sensibilities and they brought a lot of UX speakers onto the platform. So there's been this ongoing smuggling of UX more and more into product for a while that I definitely see myself as, as part of. And yet the business training is useful. I mean, I, I, I don't have an MBA, um, but the first, but when I uh, left AOL as a relatively newly minted product, you know, uh, met, uh, director, and then went to join that startup cloud on, I more or less apprenticed myself to my boss at the time, a fellow named Jay Zaveri, who is a VC now at Social Capital, but he was our chief product officer. I think he was just called VP product at the time, but CPO when we finished. And so we had one of those great partnerships you can sometimes have, especially when you're coming up, where you're the junior partner and you're more operational and executing, and the senior partner is more visionary and outwardly facing and, and, and strategic. And yet over time, he essentially trained me. He taught me how to do a lot of the analytical data tasks I didn't know how to do to, to a lot of the things that we had to, that you can now do with stats packages, but literally five, 10 years ago, it was getting out the spreadsheets and downloading the data and then figuring out the coefficient of virality or, or, or what the retention percentage was for that, that cohort over that part of time. So there was a opportunity there for me to fill in those gaps. And I wouldn't say it's the equivalent of a, of a master's degree in business, but I feel like I got a business education doing the job of some a relevant one, but I consciously sought it out. I sought mentors, I sought bosses in context where I'd be forced to learn those things. And so now, bean counter is a pejorative, right? I mean, I, I, when I use that term, I use it facetiously or jokingly or to make light of the idea that, that we often frame these business people as the you know, the heavies, the going to the dark side, as they call it. When I was in publishing, I worked as an editor and also for, for a while as a writer. And then I became a literary agent, as I think I meant, you mentioned in the intro. And I was teased at the time by my editor friends that I had gone to the dark side because a, a, a literary agent is basically a salesperson, you know, and, and, and they sit across the desk trying to get the money out of the publisher. So it's not the first time in my career that I went down the taboo path that the my kind of like, you know, self-perceived artistic friends viewed as somehow the money grubbing one or something like that. But I think, again, that's a little bit of an oversimplification about someone's got to, someone's got to look after the money. I'm, I'd never be a good accountant, but I wouldn't want to work at a company that didn't hire accountants because they're not creative enough or not the right kind of spirits for the company or something like that. So, I mean, it's a really long answer to your question, but I guess what I'm saying is that, sure, there's a lot of people who are very comfortable in their business grounding, working in product roles. The product role is still perceived as a business role, especially by leadership. So coming in the door with that is often helpful. I'm just sort of like to tell UX people that it's not a foreign language they can't learn and that it's not irrelevant to the things they know how to do, that they can map the things that they know how to do onto this space and, 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 and become quite proficient at it. You touched on maturity there, how you felt that product was roughly a decade behind the maturity of UX. And you've said that... Um, in terms of respect and power that UX have, you've also said that if you ever have had a job and people went into the conference room and then they came out later with a plan and you're like, I want to be in the room while those conversations are happening, product management does get you in that room. You know, and you spoke about a little bit earlier about the, you know, the so-called seat at the table. And that is something that is it's really coveted in design circles. It's something that we spend a lot of time talking about and obsessing about. And it's something that we don't really feel like we have that sort of strategic influence in, well, not across the board. Of course, it's, I'm generalizing here. There are very uh, senior design leaders making great impact in their organizations. Uh, but this is definitely something that vexes people. You know, what has What's happened here? You know, so something like product management that you're considering relatively less mature than UX, but seems to, on on the other hand, have a greater role in shaping 
the the direction and the outcomes that the experiences that UXs are working on. How do these two things? How do you reconcile these two things? Yeah, I think it's it's a great question. I, I think there's probably a couple things at work. One is that I think product management came into being as a more business perceived as a more businessy role, and therefore, I think the sort of we were talking earlier about kind of identity, cult, almost cultural identity around, say, like a creative or a design role that a person may in some ways derive some self-esteem from saying, my job is special. You need to be talented. You, you need to have my skills. And, and it's not the kind of job where you just, uh, you know, put in, you can't measure it. It's, cre- you know, like there's this idea that, that we want space to, to legitimately explore, to make mistakes, to have role gathering. And we know how creativity works. It, it, it is invisible to a lot of people. It does look like you, you're just goofing around and then suddenly, you know, so there's that legitimate need to, to, to fight for that room for actual creativity. I, I, don't, I never want to mock creativity or anything like that. It's just that when it becomes an identity, then I think it starts to separate you from everybody else. So you're like, you're the one department that has no numbers that can't like track against goals because you're creative. I mean, like at some point you still have to speak the language of the central organi- organizing principles of the company. And I think product management came into being already speaking that language. And UX is sometimes fighting, is, is, is ambivalent about whether it wants to speak that language effectively or whether that would mean losing something important. I have colleagues and friends who feel like I'm sort of doing a bad thing in some, well, not, I wouldn't say a bad thing, my friends don't think I'm doing a bad thing, but, that, but, but I have been accused by one or two people that, that essentially I'm betraying UX by sort of just accepting products ascendancy and joining their team, you know, and, and there's probably a kernel of truth that we talked before that like I've, I've hopped from trapeze to trapeze. If I thought that was the, the vehicle to continue to do what I wanted to do or to, or to get further into what I wanted to do, there's certainly a self-serving aspect to that. And then I'd say, I also feel like, I, but I'm bringing my UX sensibility into the product role and I'm making space for that to be a legitimate way to do the work on behalf, not for the people who come after me, but inevitably, if I'm successful, I will make more room for people to come after me. And I do believe in going where reality is right now, rather than just aspirationally hoping it will come around to where I would like it to be. So I think it's something like what I think I hinted at before, that that if you want the seat at the table, you know, you have to accept what comes with that. Um, and it might be that that's different from being the person who is not in the room, but also not accountable for the decisions made in the room. Like you, you may miss the innocence you had, you know, once once you have to own the decisions too. Or you may say, no, this is what I wanted. Let me in the room. Like like I did. I, I want to be in that room and I try to get myself in it. I've never, I've never loved not. And sometimes it's not even that I want to put my thumb on the scale and drive the decisions. I'm just super nosy. I, I want to know everything that's going on. I hate there to be like a level of information I don't have yet. And so I, that's not even a great thing. It just happens to be true uh, for me. So, you know, I, I just, I feel like I haven't quite scratched all the way to, to something that you're getting at there. I mean, some of it's anxiety. I do think UX is getting a seat at the table. I think it's coming. I think it is happening. And there are more and more examples of it. It's just that I, I especially think that UX and product in leadership is even closer together, you know, because the craft skill differences become much less, whether you're in a spreadsheet or Jira all day long or Figma or OmniGraphle all day long. That's a big difference in the lifestyle of a UX designer and a product manager. But if you're a team director going to the same strategy meetings with the same VP and one of you is running a product team and one of you is running a UX team, I mean, you can act like you're completely doing alien things, but you're really talking about 80% of the time the exact same mm. stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, we spoke early on in the conversation about your time at, at Princeton and you spoke about how growing up that you were never part of that, you know, prom queen jock kind of crowd, <laughs> right? And you elected to pursue philosophy instead of... Well, I did I did peak at eighth grade. Right, okay, all right. So there, yeah. <laughs> I was downhill from, I had a moment. Yeah, there. right. <laughs> all downhill from the rest of it. No, just kidding. But, you know, there's this there's this, uh, this notion that you pursued at, at uh, college of, you know, philosophy, of being a bit of a radical in terms of the, the group that you were part of there. And, you know, you've clearly walked a bit of a radical career path. But there is this tension that exists and you you touched on it before about the the sort of view that ux 
uh, is more pure somehow than perhaps product management in terms of the business side of things. You know, and I, I've been wondering, you know, is this symptomatic of an underlying tension between people who have come up through more of maybe a liberal arts background as opposed to people that have come up more through a, a businessy analytical, you know, the world is a certain, you know, specific, looks a certain specific way, uh, black and white point of view. And again, I'm projecting a lot, a lot into that. But is this is this a result of where people's origins are and how they and how they fundamentally look at the world? I'm not sure. I, I think. I mean, I, I think it must on some level. These things that 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 start to show up as patterns that are associated with career or, 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 you know, even hobby or interests, I'm sure there's some kind of correlation. Like when they look at political sensibilities and find that there's certain, you know, people who respond more to certain stimuli tend to lean, tend to be instinctively more one political way, people who respond more to other stimuli. So there's, there's probably some stuff at root there. I noticed this an analogous thing once, you know, I, I was a content strategist when I, when I got my first tech job, that was kind of my publishing to tech transition was through content. And I noticed the content people I worked at at a dot com, worked with at a dot com, had a habit that I found kind of self-defeating that, that reminds me that I saw again with UX, some UX people in the future, which was um, almost like an inability to, to decide between whether what you do is a, a unique and special and valuable skill, and that it's completely reasonable not to have that skill. People who don't have that skill are per perfectly decent, normal people who are just fine, who will pay you because you're a professional at this great thing, or everybody else is an idiot because how come they can't <laughs> copy edit like me and aren't as good at writing? Mm -hmm. You know, and and so, so if you're going to be, if you're going to act superior <laughs> in some ways and like the other people are deficient, that's having the chip on your shoulder and gets you excluded from the conversation because you're sort of annoying to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, you're arrogant mm -hmm. and and. Um, you're a jerk. If you recognize like, like, hey, not everybody's supposed to be a writer. Not you know, a lot of people think they are because we all write emails or whatever. But like if you recognize like I have a valuable professional skill, I'm great at crafting language that meets the needs. You know, content design nowadays, content strategy, that's a whole profession, much more mature than when I was having that title. Then at the same time, you need to treat the people with respect who don't have those skills or, or, or else you're saying – this is, I'm just scamming you. I just think everybody should be able to do this and I'm making a living because you're all so stupid. I mean, that, that's really not a nice way to work with other people. And I'm not saying those people go around doing that, but I think inherently if you built your self-esteem around how special what you do is, then it can creep in that other people are not as special as you and they they understand that you feel that way. Yeah, it's a, it's a very fragile way to move through the world and strikes me to be quite a limiting way. Now, I'm, I'm reluctant to bring Apple into this conversation as Apple is often thrashed to death in terms of a case study, but I am curious about someone in Apple who, again, is probably thrashed to death in terms of a case study, but Steve Jobs. And I, w I wanted to ask you about your perspective on Steve Jobs. You know, was he someone that was more akin to a product manager or more akin to a UX designer? Oh, that's a really great question. Yeah, you know, I think he was probably more like a product manager. I'd say the thing that he did, as I understand it, that was most like what a product manager does or a product leader, anybody taking responsibility in product, is I think that he provided focus, clarity, and, you know, and, and, and expectations. You know, he defined good enough. He set it really high, a really high bar for good enough. But regardless, he said there was a bar and he determined whether it had been met or not. And, and, and I think he was, you know, able to mobilize teams or say, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this moonshot. We're going to solve this problem. And that is what a product manager, product manager should be bringing to the table is all the things we could do. We figured out that we're going to do this now. And it's the exclusion of other things and, and making difficult choices so that we can do something very diff, you know, challenging um, at the limits of our ability that's worth spending our time on. I think if you, the, the thing is he was the boss though, too. So it's, it's easier to do that when you can fire everybody, you know, and, and product managers famously cannot fire everybody. That's almost the definition of the job is that they, not, nobody reports to you. So, so it's a metaphor, right? I mean, he was a, he was a more producty CEO, I think, than a, than a design CEO. And in the same way that I think a very good, practitioner of product should have an exquisite sensibility about design and, and really high expectations and standards, 
and then should find brilliant designers, probably like Johnny Ive or whoever, to you know, and and the real, you know everybody else who did all the work on those teams and empower them and set goals for them, et cetera. And the truth is, I think he was a marketing guy. Now that's a dirty word in some circles. Right, and I I I, I would challenge people to rehabilitate their stereotypes about marketing mm. too. Yeah, you've talked about in the past how product and UX actually share. I believe you have. So let me know if I'm putting words in your mouth here, that they actually share a common common heritage in terms of both of them being somewhat attributable back to marketing as a profession. Yeah, I think that that's true, both literally, that I think that's, that there's a lineage, you know, that you can probably trace back with some of the roots of UX uh, uh, drawing on some marketing traditions. And and absolutely, product management has, has a marketing um, genealogy contributing a strain along with others that goes into it, it, its its coalescence as a, as a job. And I'd say even more so that marketing and product management and UX are all, I'd say, manifestations of attempts to, to get serious about making products for people. You know, like so, so marketing as a 20th century, quote unquote, scientific business practice emerged you know to say hey let's let's actually do research let's do surveys let, let's segment the population let's let's you know figure out the kind of c- communications that will drive sales or build awareness and all, all these sorts of things that we kind of take for granted now and you know if you if you came up doing ux in a in a in a world where the marketing team owned the website and they fought with it over it and they just saw it as a communications vehicle and they wanted to print the org chart as the navigation, then, then sure, it's understandable to say marketing, that's this terrible discipline that totally doesn't get UX and shouldn't be anywhere near the internet or something like that. And which is silly um, because going to the market is, is you know, you, you can't sell your stuff if you don't have an approach to, your, to getting to the market. Clearly you need to be working with those folks. And yeah, maybe some of them got communications degrees and were the king and queen of the prom. And maybe they're not, your cup of tea, whatever, you know, the, 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 still they're, they're doing work that, that like you're all interdependent on each other. And there's, you know, and growth is just sometimes like it, it, people often joke that growth hacking was just like guys doing marketing or something like that, you know, I mean, and, and, and that's a bit of, that's reductive, you know, but, but it's this idea that it, certainly growth hacking or growth product work is analytical, is, is uses experiments, it, it's this whole practice of trying to grind out results. And so it, it has a different style than the way a lot of marketing is practiced, which is often like, let's plan the campaign and get the assets together. And however, I, I've been in shops where marketing was practiced with a lot of rigor and a lot w- with goals that were then measured and outcomes. And then, and, and so as that converges, it seems, it seems very similar. So anyway, yeah, I, I think that the there's this ongoing history of trying to get better and better at tuning what you're making for actual people. And I think marketing was part of it. And sure, all, all disciplines, you know, get genericized over time and kind of lose some of their oomph from when they started. It'll, it'll happen to UX too, I suspect, eventually. But there's probably some, I'm, I'm sure, because I'm not deeply in this world, but there's probably some corner of the marketing world right now that is full of vitality and very excited about how it's embracing new technologies and and you know, and, and is and is valid. Now, Christian, you spoke about rigor, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately as well, especially when it relates back to the research practice in UX and how research is used to inform design and product decisions. And I, I want to segue away from that just briefly and perhaps come back to it, because you've also said that leadership has has somehow said these designers and these creative people and these engineers, they need a manager. And that term nowadays is product manager. And when I heard you say that, and again, I don't want to sort of hammer this point too hard, but it certainly made me feel or it sounded like you felt that leadership, which I'm associating with the business, didn't want the lunatics running the asylum. Well, that's interesting. I'm trying to think of the the source where I said it was on the thrive the thrive podcast that interview you recently did interesting okay yeah and I think it probably goes back to that idea of the product management role being one that I think was cooked up inside the organizations Mm. rather than you know fought for in a kind of like insurgent way you know where like UX kind of had to break into the organizations on some level whereas I feel like product management 
was framed as uh, a role that, you know, in some ways probably started to take the place of program management or, or, or there were people called producers in the, in, the, in the early internet. And some of them were starting to do these keeping their eye on everything role. So I think some people just looked more like the point person to relay all the news through. And that role got defined as product management from above. I, and I don't think that, I mean, if, if that were happening now, UX people could probably jump in and go, that's me, you know, and, 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 and say, you don't need another job. I'll do it. But I don't think that, you know, I mean, I don't know. When I was at, at Yahoo, our UX practice was called UED, user your experience design. And it was part of the product organization. And if you went up the org chart, you hit a product person, usually pretty quickly, you know, so that subordination existed from fairly early on, even though the product management profession keeps changing and evolving, whatever was being called product back then was already had the upper hand. And I think it is because the, you know, the, the leadership org structure saw these people as sort of little accountable nodes in the network. I had a conversation with Marty Kagan last year, and he has a similar career path to you in some respects where he came up through engineering and then seems to have seen a similar thing that you saw in terms of being able to have more influence over how things actually get done, get that seat and transitioned into product management from there. I think he came up through HP. I just want to come back to IA and your role in the Information Architecture Institute and your time in that space. And I want to come back to a keynote address that you gave in 2020, where you were talking about the responsibility, the ethical responsibility that IAs, and I'm going to make this synonymous with UXs and perhaps even product people, but for this particular question with UX, this responsibility that we have to our users in the spaces that we're creating for them. And I'll just quote you again now, Christian. You said information architects have a huge responsibility to think about what we are building and not just how effectively we are doing it. And this, why this is something that I'm asking you is we've been exploring this role that UX either plays or doesn't play in making those important decisions, you know, in those conference rooms that we were talking about earlier. And so my question is, if we're not the ones in that conference room making those decisions on business strategy and product strategy, how can IAs or UXs be responsible for the ethical implications of the strategies and the actions that fall out of those strategies? Yeah, and I think you're, you're say, if I understand the question correctly, you're sort of saying if, if UX people are responsible, what agency do they have to actually to actually take that responsibility? Or, I suppose the um, way that I'm fr um, framing this is if UXs are not represented at the table for whatever reason, then how mm -hmm. can they be called upon to be responsible for the out outcomes of the decisions that are made at those tables in those conference rooms? Sure. So I think that there's there's the concept of above my pay grade, right? It's like, oh, I don't make those decisions. I, I, I just do what I'm told or I just, you know, I'm, I, I don't know. I don't know what the the bosses are planning next quarter. I'm, I've got some stuff to design it. And I think, and certainly even on that level, whatever scale you're working on, whatever problem you're working on, you can be the person who is uh, widening the lens, who is looking at the systemic picture and not just the kind of point solution that you're working on, who is exploring pos possible consequences and ad even adverse side effects of, of the cluster of things that you're doing kind of kick the tires ethically in a sense. And then you can say, well, you run into a problem, but now you're not, you know, it's already been decided you're going to ship this feature, even though you've just discovered it can be used to abuse people or something, or, or you know, it's dangerous in some way. I think those are the kinds of moments in our work lives where we have to assess the relative importance of something of value we have and the other real considerations in our lives, like, well, I need this job or no one listens to me anyway, or, you know, things like that. But there are moments where you might have to say, this is what I'm here for. I'm, I'm a user-centered designer. If I don't say this, who else, as you said, who else can, I mean, you might say, I don't have the power. I'm not in the room where this was decided, but also they didn't do this research. Like they don't know that we're, we accidentally created a gun or something like that. So there are times when I think the job is to kind of knock on the door of the room or schedule time with the product manager, whoever does, whoever's adjacent to you, and say, I'm, I'm worried we're making a terrible mistake, or I think there's a problem here. 
I've put together a diagram using my amazing diagramming skills, or uh, you know, I, I've written something with my good my good way with words or whatever to help make this case, and then am, give ammunition to the this person who represents me in that room. I mean, we're none of us are comp- we don't work in isolation. We're part of a system where we work. So this is you know, idealized. You might not have good relationships with those people. You might not have any. No one listens to you. But I think that's a larger question. Then you have to say, why am I working in a place where I have no say and nobody cares when I notice something bad? You said, oh, we're dumping toxics in the river. You know, like it's the same question in some way. It's like, do you alert the bosses and they go, oh, no, that's terrible. Or do they they go fire him? You know, and then you realize this is an evil corporation. I can't work for these people anymore. Not everything's that cut and dried, obviously. And and there are ethical considerations or more subtle considerations where you're like, oh, that, that is this good or bad. I'm not sure. But I think... You can be the person making sure it's always part of the uh, of the conversation. You can make sure that you don't, you know, you don't create zoos with open lion cages, you know, just because it looks cool, you know, the open plan or whatever. It's, it's like you, you do the math on what would that be like for human beings being put into that environment. Worst case, I often feel like if you can't change something or you don't have the say on it and, and you can't leave or, or, or you don't believe that would be the most effective thing to do, you can kind of like put a marker down and say, all right, no one's listening to me, but I predict that if we do this, this will happen. And I think that in six weeks, we should come back and see whether I'm right or I was just crying wolf and it was all all good. you know. And now many people say, well, I don't want to hear it. you know. But, but I mean, if you're right, why not? Why shouldn't they be willing to check? Like, they didn't do your idea. They, they did it anyway. If you were wrong, then just admit it. Okay, I was a little too worried. It seems like people know how to run past the line cage fast enough and no one's died yet. It's fine. You know, but, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of like play acting out how some of these things may work. But I, I, I think that the, the idea is that you have ways to influence works through adjacency, right? I mean, I, I remember a great presentation Luke Rabluski did when we were both at Yahoo once to, to designers, helping them learn how to influence the company. And one of the things that he said was that influence really only like it's only very strong to people who are directly above, directly below, or directly adjacent to you. And it's a little bit less the next level out. And it's a little bit, ne- and that's true for everybody. It's not, so the CEO likewise has very little influence over the line worker. You know, they, they influence the, the C-suite and the SVPs. And after that, it's that they don't see that, you know, they see a summary or something like that. So, but the reverse of that is therefore you do influence the people who are around you and that's your job. Right? Maybe you're not in the room and you don't get to decide, but you can be the person pushing these ripples of insight through the org and hopefully you develop those channels you know, and you manage up and, and things like that. That is such an important reminder. And I think what you've just touched on there is it's really on each of us to define our sphere of influence to understand what the dynamics are between the people that we're adjacent to and and also not to... I suppose not to be too fatalistic when it comes to whether we can or can't change the status quo. There's a lot of power that is tied up in the stories that we tell ourselves and a lot of disempowerment that is tied up in those stories as well. So that was a really refreshing take to hear, Christian. Now, I'm just mindful of time. I want to bring us down to the close to the show. And I'm going to quote you again. I know I've been doing a lot of that lately, but you've had so many great, great quotes. I love it. It's very flattering. (laughs) So you've... (laughs) Who is this guy? (laughs) (laughs) You've said that writing is absolutely a core skill of mine. The connection between it and what I do in the workplace is that I think and communicate as a storyteller. A big part of how I lead, resolve conflict, bring groups to consensus and focus on action is through articulating clear and compelling narratives. So to finish our conversation today, what's the story, the narrative that you want the people in product and in UX to start telling themselves about the work they do together? And some of this I think I've touched on already, but I, I, I would like people working in product roles and in UX roles to, first of all, you know, recognize a very strong potential, let's say at least, for kinship between those roles. For the, for the, the, there's a strong basis for collaboration and alignment. And I don't mean that in a Pollyanna sense where it will just happen because some things are aligned. I think that but what I mean is that there's the beginning of that. There's the opportunity for alignment because of so many shared concerns. And that there's friction. There, there, there's translation across 
language, you know, uh, terminology and, and even priorities and sometimes even values that mean that this is not a seamless, you know, linking arms and marching off to the horizon together. There's work to be done, creative work, you know, like the work we do on designing systems, but around designing our work, designing our relationships, or surfacing issues and working through them rather than kind of wishing they would the boss would fix it or just hoping that person leaves or something like that. And and probably if I had to really boil it down, I have this kind of message that has come up so often in my coaching and advising and, and just general talk around this space. And there's a version of it for both of the roles that's very similar. And we hinted at this already. UX people, you know, hey, UX people, you say you're the empathy people, you say you're the compassion people. You've got all these amazing skills you've developed, proficiencies for recognizing why people are stuck, why they're unhappy, why things aren't working well for them, why they're ending, why they're conflicted, and understanding, you know, exploring better ways that their that their workflows could go or that their days could go, and you know, and and learning their words and their concepts, and then designing things that that bridge the gap between what you think would be good for them and what they want and and, and presenting it to them in a way that's desirable to them that they recognize is the thing that they want but that over time of course helps them evolve towards the way you believe it could be better for them well, I mean and I, and I think that it's probably obvious what I'm saying at this point which is that you can do that same work with product managers that you work with you can treat them like a person who is having an experience who isn't always happy who's not maybe conflicted who may be causing problems or having problems and you can learn their language and their concepts and you can think about the experience of working with you and working in a team and you can apply those kind of suit what I call your superpowers to to that you know to 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 framing it in a way where they can enter into your world and get the value from it that, that they really would, you know, your ability to diagram, your ability to contextualize, synthesize, draw inferences, have, you know, creative leaps of insight that, that solve a gestalt problem. Those are all things that, that, that will be huge assets to a product person who understands that they can get that by partnering with UX people. But if you say, well, they got to come to me and you cross your arms, that may never happen. Whereas if you're willing to bridge the gap and sort of think of it as a UX challenge, an experience challenge, I think you'll find you have all the tools you, you need to, to figure that out. Same thing over to my, my product brethren and sestrin I, 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 of all stripes. I would say it's a little bit more of a stretched metaphor, metaphor, but if you think of working with you as a product, you know, you know, what's it like to work with me? What's the experience of kind of, you know, what's the, un, what's the first time user experience of being working with me as a product manager, for, especially for these UX people who maybe, you know, aren't, fully bought into product management, you know, like, like, just like they might not have been fully bought into some product I'm trying to sell. So how do I figure out what they do want and what they're looking for? And how do I present and help them understand what I'm doing as a product manager? And particularly, how do I help bring, how do I help them understand constraint, real constraints that they're not always privy to, that I see in, in talking to the sales folks and talking to the chief technical architect of the company and things like that, that would help them do better UX work because they might not go down a road that's never going to pan out or they might, you know, j just be better informed about we're all getting fired if we don't sell more of this stuff next year. So let's just fix the design on this thing. You know, like, like the, there's a there's an element where it's like it would help you to know that sometimes those things. And you might not want to live in that world because you want to do your UX and you want to focus on the end user. But these are material considerations about whether your your design will ever ship and 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 what it has to get through to actually reach the market and stuff like that. So I think... If product people can can do that, you know, their own version of, uh, they don't call it empathy, they call it like customer obsession or something like that, but get obsessed with your UX people for a little while and think of them as people who are looking for solutions, looking for ways to, to get their jobs done and stuff like that and, and, and create the product management experience as something, you know, as a product for them that they want to buy over and over again. I mean, you know, at this point, it's kind of silly stretching the metaphor so far, but what you find is that there's there's a huge toolkit there. And it's just sitting unused often. You know, it, 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 you throw the kitchen sink at the end user to get any little clue about them. And you remain very ignorant about the people, you know, on the other side of the cubicle. 
often. Christian, that's such an important point, and it's also a really important bridge to be building. So I was so stoked when I saw that's New Zealand speak for really pleased when I when I found that your <laughs> book had come out because it was actually one of the bridges I was attempting to build on this podcast between these adjacent fields. So thank you for putting all your expertise and your energy into this book and to sharing it with both of these communities. And thank you for such an enjoyable conversation today. Certainly plenty of things in there for people from both communities to think about. I really, really appreciate you spending some time sharing your insights with me today and also the insights that you've shared over the years in this profession or this field or the fields that you've strad straddled. They've been excellent and they've made a lot of difference. That's very kind of you to say that. And thank you. I had a really good time with our conversation. I look forward to other people getting a chance to listen in. Oh, you're most welcome. It was my pleasure. And Christian, if people want to find out more about you, about product management for UX people, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, well, probably you can come to designinproduct.com. That's designinproductallruntogether.com. That's both the website for the consulting work I do, and it links to the book page and things like that. And it's also where if you're interested in this discussing product management and UX and where they overlap, there's a, a link to join the community that I host. And there's a little form to fill out just so I figure out, make sure you're not a bot or a spammer, but otherwise I, I'll let you in if you're interested. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Christian. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything that we've covered will be in the show notes, including where you can find that community that Christian just mentioned, his book and all of the great things that he's been up to. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and yes, product management, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe, and also tell someone who you feel would get value from these conversations. Pass the podcast along. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on LinkedIn under Brendan Jarvis. There's also a link to my profile in the show notes on YouTube, and I believe also on the podcast platforms as well. Or you can head on over to my website, which is thespaceinbetween.co.nz. That's thespaceinbetween.co.nz. And until next time, keep being brave.